So the same thoughts that keep you up at night, keep me up at night. Because okay. for a long time, for me, money was a motivator because I grew up poor. So I know what it's like to not have anything. And then to have money, you're like, oh, is this it? My motivator is creating. As long as I'm alive, I'm just going to have ideas and I'm going to try and make them happen. That is where I've now become comfortable within myself. And in all of those ideas, if I can give back and make someone feel good or make them laugh or, or provide something that changes their life in yeah. a little way, then I'm happy. Hey friends, welcome back to Deep Dive. If you're new here, my name is Ali and in each episode I chat to entrepreneurs, authors, creators and other inspiring people about how they got to where they are and the strategies and tools that we can collectively use on our shared journey of living healthier, happier, more productive lives. My conversation this week is with Patricia Bright. Patricia is a YouTuber, an entrepreneur, a writer, a podcaster and so many more things. She's got 2.85 million subscribers on her fashion and beauty channel. She has another half a million subscribers on a personal finance theme channel and she's got over 1 million followers on her Instagram where she posts mostly about beauty and lifestyle and that kind of stuff. But her life wasn't always like this. Uh, her journey started in a council estate in South London where, to use her words, she was totally broke. And when she was in school, she became this self-proclaimed hustler. She started making money uh, doing hair for the girls in her school for five pounds a pop so that she could make money to buy school dinners with. And from those humble beginnings, she is now CEO of a multi-million dollar empire. In this episode, we touch on a few things. We talk about success, the idea of success, where that comes from, from how kind of financial success relates to success in life and how me and Patricia think about those things. We talk about how we can figure out what to do with our career in terms of like, do we want to do something that makes a lot of money or do we want to do something that follows our passion and that we feel more fulfilled by? I really enjoyed having the conversation. Um, it's amazing how open and transparent and honest Patricia is and how much of herself she has kind of put out there on the internet. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation between me and Patricia Bright. You started your YouTube channel in 2010, mm -hmm. uh, like age, like in the original, original days of YouTube. And yeah. Um, obviously the, the, um, the landscape of YouTube was very different in 2010 than it is now in 2022. Very different. Um, and you've become like phenomenally successful on the platform. You've got your own like YouTube original series, you've yeah. got your own documentary, you had the podcast, which did amazingly billboards on Times Square, that, that whole shebang. Um, one thing that you said in, in your, in your YouTube original documentary thing was that you've had all the success, but you don't feel successful. Um, mm. and I wanted to ask like, what, what, what do you mean by that? So I actually think that was at the time then. I've had a lot of um, therapy and coaching since then and I'm really excited by what I've done. But at the time, naturally, I'm not very good at seeing the things that I've achieved because there's so many things that I still want to do. And I think what is the definition of success is like quite hard to to put your finger on. And I don't think at the time I had my finger on what success looked like to me. Mm. And I felt like there was more things that I wanted to do and there still are. There are more things that I want to do. So that's maybe one of the reasons why I felt like I wasn't successful, but I take it back because I am successful and I've done amazing. So, okay. yeah. so what was the, uh, what were the learnings from say therapy or coaching and stuff that made you now feel that, oh, I'm actually successful? Oh, just mindset. Like I didn't realize that, you know, thoughts become, and I'll shout out to Jacqueline because she's amazing and she's helped me a lot. Um, but thoughts become your feelings, right? So I realized that I had the wrong kind of thoughts, these weird imposing thoughts that would say you're not successful or you haven't done or you haven't achieved. So then I would feel like that. Whereas now, if I look at the reality of, of actually, I've done this thing, I've got a show, I've had a YouTube channel for 10 years. I've built an audience. I have sold product. I've done so many things. Actually, all that evidence supports um, success in the things I've wanted to be successful in. So that is, that's it. Okay. Just looking at the reality. So, is it, so it sounds like you're sort of objectively analyzing, be like, here, here are all my kind of accolades, achievements, et cetera. Yeah. Therefore, surely this must be me yeah. and I'm successful. And then if you tell yourself that enough, then over time, yeah. Uh, with the right professional to help we help guide you through the process you genuinely start to believe it yeah you just look at the facts like and i think sometimes our minds tell us all these weird lies that aren't actually based in like reality it's not true so you have to sometimes take a step out and look at it from a more logical perspective and then replace those weird biological or weird psychological thoughts to then um kind of reframe things it's, it strikes me that like, so you are sort of by almost every definition, phenomenally successful. Mm. Um, do you think that, let's say, if there is a more quote normal person dis listening to this who doesn't have like huge businesses and brands built mm -hmm. up under their name, um, do you need to have those kind of essentially tick boxes in order to feel successful? Or do you think there's stuff that people who 
aren't as objectively successful as you can do or can think to f essentially feel feel better about themselves. Uh, that kind of thing. Definitely. Well, I think it's for you to define what success means for you. So what does that look like? Success might be, I got that job that I wanted to apply for, or I got the grade, or I did the work I needed to do, yeah. so I'm successful, or I've looked after my family well. So I think that the first place everyone needs to start is defining what's important to them and why those factors are important to them. Is it from external sources or peer pressure hmm. or social media? Are all of those things being told to you that they're important or are they coming from yourself? So that's a whole exercise everybody needs to do. Like, what do I actually want? Who do I actually want to be? What do I actually find? Uh, what do I define success as to me? And then check yourself. Why do I think that makes me successful? Yeah. Is it external factors? So was that the kind of, the kind of exercises that you did with your coach and, and therapist and things? Or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, in terms of thinking about stuff a lot more. But I think I've just become a more introspective person in general. Okay. And I just like to analyze like why do I think and feel or want a certain thing? Especially because I'm in this world, I know what that pressure of seeing what everybody else is doing, seeing what everyone else has. Like I can see how that can completely com bombard your brain and tell you, you need that, you need to be like that. And then sometimes you just have to check yourself. So I've had to do a lot of checking of myself over and over again um, to really be clear on what makes me tick. Mm. Yeah, this is the stuff that I've been thinking about a lot recently, like in the, in the last year or so, especially like after I left medicine and decided mm -hmm. that, uh, hey, I'm gonna go all in on this like internet stuff. Mm -hmm. It was a case of like defining, well, what is this internet stuff? Um, yeah, <laughs> do I, still yeah. working that out yeah, now. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Like what, what, is does, what does the brand look like? What do I actually want to be doing mm -hmm. three years, five years from now mm -hmm. in a world that's constantly evolving? Mm -hmm. And like, I can't imagine myself continuing to be like, hey friends, welcome back to the channel when I'm 50 years old. So mm -hmm. what the hell am I going to be doing then? Mm -hmm. Like how, how did you kind of tackle these, these sorts of thoughts? So I'm still tackling those thoughts. But the way I tackle it is that I, so I've, I've defined that for me, I like the idea of being able to think about something that I'm interested in and making that thing become something. Okay. So that is my process. So if it's a case of I want to grow tomatoes, yeah. tomatoes, tomatoes, um, and I and I work out how to get my soil with the right pH and I find the seeds and I water them every day and I grow tomatoes, then I'm happy. So it, as long as I'm able to kind of make decisions and we're all gonna make different decisions at so many different phases in our lives. Like maybe it's for me, also parenting was one for me. So I knew that I wanted to have children, I'm gonna do it and I did it. <laughs> Not that it's hard to do that, but it is kind of hard yeah. like nowadays. But yeah, that is how I'm kind of going through the process now. It's just my desire is just to keep creating. Uh, and it might not be creating on YouTube. It might yeah. be creating life. It might be creating a vegetable garden. It might be creating a brand, but I can do that at 95. Okay. I can still create. So I've realized that's what I want to be as an individual. Mm. Okay. So yeah, often when I speak, so when I speak to people who are maybe in their sort of early to mid twenties and they're having that crisis of, I don't know what to do. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of the internet would say, Hey, find, find your passion and follow that passion. I don't believe in that. Oh, you don't believe in that. Don't believe in passions. <laughs> I absolutely think that's so dead. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I just interrupted you, but I, great, yeah. well, like, I don't believe in yeah. like the idea of following a passion, especially if you're broke or you're hungry. Cause Passion may not put food on the table and passion isn't going to pay the rent, right? So once you've been able to kind of deal with those basis, those basics there, like get those covered. And then I think it's about you defining like what is something you have skills in doing now and um, you, again, are interested in. You can execute in that kind of, those key areas. And I, don't, I wouldn't call that passion. I'll just call it, what would I call it? Like working on your strengths or or like play, playing to your strengths, that kind of thing? Yeah, playing to your strengths, but just doing something. So like sometimes that, that you, you're waiting for passion to come or like a, a wind of inspiration to come and it's not going to come. You're going to wait forever. So it's better to just do something, anything. It doesn't even have to be the thing that you're passionate about or you like. Maybe it's the thing you can do right there and then. It might be like, oh, I'm not passionate. Okay, let me just you know, read the book or clean my room or make a meal or go on a walk. Doing something versus doing nothing is a good idea. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of like what 
Cal, Cal Newport talks about in So Good They Can't Ignore You. Uh, he talks about this idea of kind of follow, follow your passion is really terrible advice mm. because as you said the, you know you're pa- i'm passionate about playing the guitar the chances of me making a career out of playing the guitar are minuscule exactly and uh instead if you aim to become really good at something then a passion often develops for the thing that you are then really good at i love that and then you can as you become good at the thing it then gives you career capital and often the thing that makes people passionate about their job is a sense of autonomy, a sense of freedom, a sense mm-hmm. that they can do what they want with their time. Mm-hmm. And if you're really good at something, you can then negotiate autonomy, even if, you, if, even if you're not an entrepreneur or a creator, even as an employee, you can yeah. find that passion, but you have to become good at something first, rather mm-hmm. than thinking, oh, I'm passionate about guitar, I'm passionate about football, I'm obviously gonna make a career out of that, mm-hmm. which is just kind of generally unre- <laughs> unrealistic for most people. Exactly. I even say this, that I'm actually passionate about eating sweets and chocolate and watching Netflix. But that is not going to be helpful for me in the long run if I just focus on binging on shows and eating high calorie snacks that aren't good for me. We're going to take a very quick break to introduce our sponsor for this episode, who is Brilliant. I've been using Brilliant for the last few years, and they're a fantastic interactive platform with online courses in maths, science, and computer science. My personal favorites are the computer science courses. I think they're absolutely fantastic. And when I was initially applying to med school, I was actually torn between applying to medicine and applying to computer science. And I ended up going with medicine in the end, which I really don't regret. But there's a big part of me that really wanted to continue learning the stuff around computer science, continuing to understand how coding works. And the courses on Brilliant have given me that foundation in computer science, which I didn't have before. The Courses are really fun, engaging, and interactive, and the way they teach you stuff is based on very first principles thinking. Like, they'll teach you a concept, and then they'll take you through interactive exercises to actually help solidify your understanding of that concept. And it's pretty cool because they're always updating the library with new courses. For example, there's one they've just released called Everyday Maths, which is kind of like a visual exploration of the maths that we use in everyday life. Like, for example, fractions and percentages, and putting them in a context that makes it very understandable, and certainly very different to the kind of boring way that I was taught maths when I was in school. The courses and lessons are particularly good if you have a busy life with lots of stuff going on because they really teach you the stuff in bite-sized chunks so you can always return to a course at a later date if you don't have time to do it in one sitting. If any of that sounds up your street then do head over to brilliant.org forward slash deep dive and the first 200 people to hit that link which is also going to be in the video description and in the show notes will get 20% off the annual premium subscription so thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode. How do you balance that out though like sort of the balance between I'm watching Netflix because I think it's really fun versus um I'm going to hustle for my businesses because kind of ladder I want to climb. Mm. I get a lot of guilt from doing like sitting back and Mm. like watching Netflix and doing nothing. So it's a struggle for me. And then I then go on binges and I'm like three hours deep into a a show. Yeah. Um, So it's really hard to navigate that. But I think fundamentally... I feel like there's so much I know that I want to achieve that time wasted on stuff like that just isn't worth my energy. Okay. Um, so I avoid play a lot, but I enjoy what I'm doing. So like mm. I work on the Saturday and I have to stop myself from working on a Sunday yep. because I'm like, but I'm enjoying this. I like this. I want to create, I want to think of ideas. This is my fun to me. I'd rather do this than just watch a show. Um, but it's not healthy probably to like work all the time. Yeah, I think I, I I have the same thing as well, um, where, you know, my housemate might be like, oh, why are you working at 11 p.m. on a Saturday? And I'm like, Great. it doesn't feel like work because it's yeah. <laughs> fun. And I would ge- I genuinely get more pleasure out of, I don't know, coming up with video ideas or dabbling with some logo design for a new product that mm-hmm. we're doing than I would out of watching Bridgerton on Netflix or something like mm-hmm, that. Exactly. Um, where, do, where do you think that feeling of guilt comes from, though? You said you feel guilty when... You when you do a little binge? It's not an external thing. It's not that someone's going to make me feel bad about it. It's like an internal pressure that I've kind of put on myself. Like, I think we all know when there's certain things we need to get done. Like, even if it's doing our homework, we know we need to get it done. And if we're not doing it, we're going to feel a certain way. So maybe it's just something on the inside that knows that you should be doing something better. One thing that I've been, I guess, struggling with is is, 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 is very much a first world problem. But it's um like... Once you've ticked the box of like financial success, yeah. then in a way, the question in my mind becomes, well, what's the point of trying to grow the audience, trying to launch more products? Is it to make more money? Is it to help people? But like I can help people without selling my products. Like, so why would I sell my products? You know, perhaps it is to make money. Like, is it fame? Is it like, I don't know, getting more and more accolades? Is it to get on Forbes 30 under 30? Like what, what the hell am I doing all this for? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. How do, how do you think about it? So that? the same thoughts that keep you up at night, keep me up at night. Because okay. the reality is when money is no longer a motivator, because for a long time for me, money was a motivator because I grew up poor. So I know what it's like to not have anything. And then to have money, you're like, oh, is this it? It's like, oh, okay. And then like, I had an existential crisis when I was like, oh my God, I don't care about money anymore um, in that way. Um, so I think that it's like, def again, I've just find my motivator is creating. As long as I'm alive, I'm just gonna have ideas and I'm gonna try and make them happen. That is where I've now become comfortable within myself. Um, and in all of those ideas, if I can give back and make someone feel good or make them laugh or, or provide something that changes their life in yeah. a little way, then I'm happy. Uh, so I've defined that for myself now. Okay. Mm -hmm. That sounds like your North Star, kind of your core value almost is to always be creating. Yeah. Do something. Yeah. Create something. And like, you know, that, that, that process of idea to execution fills you with a lot of like internal joy. That's it. And even if you didn't make any money from it, you'd still be doing this and you'd still want to do it when you're 95 years old. A hundred percent. Yeah. Nice. But I've, I've just defined that for myself yeah. over, over the last like two years or so that I realized that is the thing that drives me. That's what made me make videos. I just wanted to make something. Yeah. I was bored, so I had to create. And then when I created, I was happy. Yeah. And then it became a business and then I was doing the same thing and I was bored of that yeah. form of creation. So I need to like switch it up for myself. Yeah, I think for me, the this uh, sort of North Star thing is just uh, teaching basically. Okay. Like for me, it's less about creating and more about teaching is that that's the thing that I would do if I wasn't getting paid for it. It's the thing I imagine myself continuing to do at the age of 95. Perfect. And I guess, um, I guess for someone listening to this, that's like something to ask yourself is like, what is, what is the thing that you would do if you won the Euro millions and you didn't need to worry about money? Mm, like, exactly. How would you actually spend your time? Mm -hmm. You probably wouldn't spend it like sipping cocktails on a beach in Thailand for more than two weeks. That's <laughs> kind of boring after exactly. a while. Um, you'd probably spend it doing something or other. And there's this new coach called Corey who I've started working with a couple of weeks ago. And he coaches a bunch of executives and things who have ticked that box of have, have made enough money. Mm -hmm. um, and what he encourages them to do is find this one core value. And it's generally rooted in some form of service. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, initially I thought my core value was freedom. But freedom is kind of like a networked good in that it's only really useful if other people that you hang out with also have similar freedom. Otherwise, yeah. you're watching Netflix at nine in the morning on a Monday while all your friends are at work. <laughs> exactly. It's, that's just not, not inherently fun. And so looking at it from a service angle made me realize that the thing that I care about is the freedom to learn and teach on my own terms. Yeah. And now I see that as like the North Star and it's like almost everything is optimizing towards, oh, I mean, you know, is this moving me towards freedom mm -hmm. to learn and teach on my own terms or away from it? And if it's moving me, me, me away from it, then there needs to be a really, really, really strong reason as to why I'm doing mm -hmm. the thing. Perfect. And it sounds like for you, that similar thing is creating in a way that potentially helps other people. Exactly, exactly. It's nice to like be clear on that. And I yeah. think it takes people a while to define what that is for them. And yeah. even learning to kind of listen to your own internal voice to determine what you truly are about. Like, I think most of us are even scared to look inside to like see, what do I actually like? I actually don't care about this kind of thing. Yeah. And it's scary to, you know, shed off the, what's the things, the the expectations yeah. of the world and outside and then just understanding yourself more and then mm. being unapologetic in, in that is like scary, but fun. Uh, how would someone, how, so how would you think about this? Let's say if you were still broke, mm -hmm. if you were still, if you hadn't taken that box of, I've made enough money to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. How do you square that? I need to make money. I need to pay the bills with, I want to do the thing that fills me with joy. I want to follow my North Star, etc. I, I wouldn't square it. Mm, okay. No, I've been too broke to try and square it in the middle. Okay. That's why. <laughs> and that's sad, but that's how I am. There's there's money to be made. There's work to be done. Like, that's why. So when I grew up, I um, wanted to do fashion. Um, fashion is a non, sounds so bad, but at the time, is a non-industry. There is no money in that. And I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. I love clothes. And I realized there is no revenue in it when I was at university. I quickly switched to accounting because accounting is a steady and stable job. Like, and I got my job and I was secured in it. And I found enjoyment out of one, the learning in accounting. I actually chose accounting because there was a module on my fashion course that was accounting and I was really good at it. And I was like, oh, I could do this. This is fun. I love numbers. So fundamentally, I, th I think it's difficult depending on where you are with squaring 
needing to make a living and be following your passion. I just wouldn't do it. I would just make a living how I need to and then leave passions for the weekend. Nice. I think most people do that. Yeah. Like you can't have both all the time, I don't think. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a fairly modern thing in the world of like uh, I've I've been doing a bunch of research into sort of the 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 history of work, right? And where where that's coming from, you know, it's part of my book. We've got a bunch of books here that are all about like the history of work and just this idea that it's it's a relatively recent phenomenon. This idea that the thing that we do for work is also the thing that should ideally fulfill us and yeah. fill us with passion and things. And I think in a dream world, of course, like everyone wants to do a job that they are also passionate about. But in the real world, probably it's quite quite hard to get to that point. And it sounds like, you know, having having been, been broke, it's way better to be making money and having passions on the weekend than it is, I guess, to be following your passion and not making money. Would you say that's fair to say? Or I mean, I just think about people who have to farm every day and people who worked in the coal mines. Do you think they're like, oh, I'm not passionate about this? They just got on with, on with it. And like, I think sometimes when you're doing a good job at what you're doing, eventually you you enjoy it. So even when I worked at, I worked at a really cool bank. I worked at Bank of Tokyo and um, I just loved, I love spreadsheets anyway, but I didn't know that I love spreadsheets and other people think it's a really boring thing. But like when I was in it and I was really involved, I was having a great time. Like it wasn't my passion, but I felt excited to be able to execute well in what I was doing. And my like manager liked me and I was doing a good job. So I could have done that for many, many years and been comfortable mm. really, but... Okay. Yeah, there's a quote I came across the other day, uh, which was along the lines of, uh, you know, th throughout history, um, uh, essentially, whenever, you, whenever you're doing a craft and there is the opportunity to do something well, mm -hmm. doing that thing well is a profound source of joy and meaning. Yes. And I find that for me and for, for friends that I speak to, when we sort of half ass our work for the sake of I'm not really enjoying it, I'm going to half ass it so that mm -hmm. I can go home and play video games in the evening or whatever that feels a lot worse than thinking, I don't really enjoy my work, but I'm, I'm just going to try getting really good at it. And even though you're putting in more work, mm -hmm. it just energizes you to a far greater degree than yeah. half-assing it and living for the weekends, as it were, does. Exactly. 100% agree with that. And even someone could say, like, being a YouTuber is the funnest job in the world, or say someone who plays video games for, like, a living. Yeah. That might be the funnest job in the world. But I bet you there are times where that play is like, I just don't want to do this today. This is boring. I'm over it. But if they do it well and play well, they'll be like, okay, I'm enjoying this. Like, I think fundamentally, almost all jobs in all careers can become a bit te tedious and it's about how you focus on or how you channel your energy into it which will change how you feel about mm. it let's talk about money let's talk about money money seems to be one of your one of your uh, favorite favorite topics just like it's one of mine <laughs> yeah um, i like talking about money yeah so uh, you're you're very open about money and stuff mm. um which is still even in 2022 a little bit rogue uh <laughs> where does your <laughs> yeah how, how how do you feel about money <laughs> broadly <laughs> I like money. I think it's a really good tool. I think it's really valuable. Um, I think it gives you loads of options. And I think from not having money to then having it, like I can just see the benefits of how it makes life so much easier. Okay. Like what, what, everyone, What's that before and after like? Like the choices that you have to make, you can probably take a bit more time to make a choice when you you have more money, you can be a bit more patient about taking the next step. Whereas if you are desperate for where your next paycheck is gonna come from, you may take a shortcut or you may do something that isn't the best for you because you really need that income, which is what so many people are dealing with all the time. So I think that money gives you the freedom to make choices that are more thought out and potentially better in the long term for you. Yeah, um, so you've got this, uh, extra, this sort of second YouTube channel, The Break, which mm -hmm. has got its own website and products and things like that, where you educate people about kind of money and finances and stuff. Yeah. I will put links to all of that stuff wherever people are watching or listening to this. Um, how, how much do you think it's actually possible for people to, I guess, change their lot in life? Kind of the whole rags to riches thing. Is that like how how does that happen, and, and is is that actually achievable for normal people? Do you think? Like, what 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 are the f different factors that go on here? This is a really hard 
Uh, and also uh, quite an upsetting question because I actually really don't think most people are going to go from rags to riches. I feel like it's a 0.001%. I feel like it's uh, based in a lot of luck. I think um, it's based in so many different factors that most people are not going to be able to ever control. Like if you grow up in some village and or a desert, that's... That's it. You've been born into that. No amount of work hard is going to make the rain come out of the sky to fulfill the drought that is causing your animals to die. Like that's something that you cannot control. So I think there's a lot of factors that people can't control. But I do think that people can focus on the little things that they can control um, to make their life a little bit easier. But most people aren't going to go from rags to witches. They might just have minor incremental improvements in their lifetime. And so when you advise people, or like it's not technically financial advice, but when you mm-hmm. educate people about money, mm-hmm. what are the, like, I guess, I guess if you were speaking to your younger self when you were broke, what, what is the advice you would have given to that younger, younger person? Actually, my number one advice is don't do what everybody else is doing. Like we're really under pressure to like spend and have and do and, fit in Mm. and I would just advise myself don't do that because most of that stuff isn't helpful for most people the classics make sense save where you can as much as you can and make more where you can how you can and live a, a bit more frugally if you're struggling financially and then invest in yourself and invest in other things to aid your opportunities for long-term growth. So I, I believe in those principles. Yeah. And that's what I would advise anybody and everyone. I'm not saying it's going to make you rich. It's not going to make you a millionaire. It's not going to make you a billionaire, but it might make your life a little bit easier if you develop those basics around finances. Yeah. What are the kind of biggest mistakes that you see people slash that you made when you were younger um, in the realm of in the realm of money? To be honest, I was pretty good with money um, because, again, I say this all the time. When you don't have like you don't I don't want to spend money um, unwittingly on on crazily because Mm. I didn't have it to spend like that. So I was pretty smart with my money and I was really good at making money. So I was making money from from 11 years old in terms of I knew that I liked money and I knew that I wanted it and I knew that if my parents can't give me dinner money to go to school, then I'm going to make my own dinner money. So I would um, like do hair in the playground and I'd make five pounds here and there. And then I would make products and I'd sell products. And, you know, even at uni, I had a part-time job and then I would have my own clients as well. So I would do hair. So I would always have money, but I would always try and save it and then spend it on the things that, you know, I liked and, um, were were valuable to me, but I never spent all of my money and I'd never be entirely broke. But then say my biggest money mistakes came when I actually started making more money and it was around like the whole business side of money. I didn't know that I had to pay taxes. Oh, and I was an yeah. accountant Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I worked in banking. So yeah. I obviously had a full-time job and then I bought a house when I was 23. Me and my husband, we bought a house together, which was really good at the time. And I was making money and I was just spending the money that I made, you know, on the house or in things that I wanted. And then I didn't realize that I was meant to pay my um, corporation tax. I didn't even know what corporation tax was. And then I ended up being slapped with a fine for like 15,000 pounds. And at the time I was like, where the hell am I going to get 15,000 pounds from? I don't, yeah. I don't know what that means. I didn't know how to like manage that or anything. So that was the like one of the big mistakes I made. Oh, wow. <laughs> I wasn't informed at all yeah. from a business perspective on how to run my finances. And you were an accountant and worked in a bank. But I guess it, like just connecting that so, to the day to day. And that's the thing about like, say the education system. I can do the corporate finance course and still get a module and get a 2-1 in my exams and then work at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch and work at all these like big firms. But they're not teaching me how to live my life as an individual and how to manage my finances as mm. an individual. And actually in the bank, so many people who work there are in debt. Like they were like, I used to see people who they're using their credit cards. They were struggling financially and they were on high salaries, but they're living beyond their means. So as soon as they made money, like they were spending more than they had, like it was crazy. So even in that industry, I think 
they were worse off because they felt like they had to keep up with everybody else. Is that something that you've kind of struggled with, the whole keeping up with the Joneses type thing? Because it, because people talk about it in films and books and stuff. But I guess I I don't, like, I think, I think of, of all of my friends, I know one guy who just freaking loves spending 600 quid on a pair of shoes just to mm -hmm. flash it at a club and then never wear it again <laughs> but every everyone else seems to be fairly like like it's it seems like it seems to me at least from the people that i know that people have realized that keeping up with the jones is a bad thing and so that mm. then just i think realizing that sort of helps people not do it in a way but yeah yeah i think it depends on your circle so my yeah. friends are not like that my friends are really normal my industry is about the spend, the glamour, the designer, the have you got the Cartier, have you got the Chanel bag, have you got the the outfits and the look. So for me, I felt like I had to keep up, like I needed the next palette, I needed the next outfit, or I needed to look amazing at the next event. So I definitely overspent many, many years yeah. um, trying to keep up with just the image of of being an influencer because we're, we're influencing others mm. and there's an aspect of being aspirational that was really important for us. Hmm. Okay, I, I guess the analogy there is when you're a tech YouTuber, you need to have the best desk, desk setup yeah. and you will splash out like thousands on a computer monitor you don't need because it will make your desk setup look nicer because it's somewhat aspirational to mm -hmm. people be like, I've got a cool desk setup. Mm -hmm. But I think you can kind of forgive that because it's like, that's your job, right? You're, yeah. you're playing the game in your job. Yeah. So do you, do people who are not professional influencers who need to play the game for their job, do you find that they also, also fall into those similar traps? So yes and no. So actually I recognize that the amount I spend on clothing and bags, <laughs> jewelry, like is, is, is maybe in, in a hundred thousand a year, right? Bloody Which God. is insane, right? <laughs> my God. But that is part of my job, <laughs> yeah. right? So, so everybody else Thought, might be like, what the yeah, hell? Yeah, tax deductible expenses. That, yeah, whereas it is, like I could expect, expense most of them. Yeah. Um, and maybe let's say 70,000 a year or something like that. So that is a lot, right? But that's the nature of my job. But the thing that started to scare me as and started to bother me was knowing that there are other people who are watching me who who it isn't their job, but I might be influencing in them yeah. in that way. So that's why I had to come and bring my finance knowledge to say, yes, I like a Chanel bag. Um, I might buy four a year. Don't buy four a year. <laughs> <laughs> Save and buy one a year. Okay, and this is how to do it. Yeah. So for me, it was really important to bring that balance because we could look like, Life is peachy and spending money all the time, but this is our job. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to encourage people to do that as much. Okay. So I guess that's how you, ba like, yeah, how, how do you balance that? I want to buy four Chanel bags a year with, I'm encouraging people to live frugally and I don't want to get a housekeeper because it might be expensive, but I'm buying four Chanel bags a year. Kind of, like, how, how, do you, how do you balance those different things? Uh <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I'm being called out, but the reality is that I'm still trying to work on that. Like, yeah. cause I think everybody has two sides. Some of us want to save more, but some of us like nice things. Mm. So I've, I've accepted that's what, who I am and, and what I'm about. But everything to me is also about balance. Like um, if I'm going to buy the four Chanel bags, maybe it won't be four, maybe it will be two. And maybe I'll make sure I've um, saved and invested um, this amount first and then I'll buy the Chanel bag. And that's how I advise anyone who follows me. Yeah. And I used to do, a, you know, the a content format I used to do was called haul videos. Oh yeah. Haul videos is you showing all the stuff. And I had a series which was called I Spent. That series probably did about 30 to 40 million views, wow. right? And it was me spending every week thousands of pounds on, on fast fashion. Yep. And people loved it. Three million views, four million views a video. Wow. But I physically couldn't do those videos anymore. I felt sick because yeah. I was like I'm just I'm part of the problem I had to stop so I think that I've got a healthy balance now how did you become so comfortable talking openly about money slash why do we not feel comfortable talking about it do you, do you reckon I don't know if I am that comfortable talking about it I talk about it because I think it's important and necessary like I still feel a bit icky sharing certain numbers but I know how beneficial it is when I do um and so I think I allow the fact that I know this is helpful um, 
to override the fact that I feel uncomfortable. And I, I've shared this story a hundred times, but as an influencer, I didn't know what my value was. I didn't know how much I should pay. I didn't know how much I should be making until I, one, accidentally stumbled across a, an assumed rate of pay. And two, someone told me how much they were making on a monthly basis and it blew my mind. And I was like, I don't even make a 10th of that. And she was maybe say double my size and was making 10 times my amount. And that was enough for me to make a decision to say, well, I'm gonna at least try and reach half. And yeah. I did that in like a month. Oh. And then yeah. I then eventually made that amount and surpassed that. But that figure was pivotal to changing my mindset. So I feel like if I can provide people insight into what's possible, then I can help them. And that's important to me. Yeah, I think that's probably similar, similar for me. Um, there is a level of, yeah, a level of discomfort I am with like sharing numbers. I, I, I think when the numbers are small, mm -hmm. it's nice and it's nice to share them. Oh, I made I made a few thousand from my business this year. Mm -hmm. When the numbers start to become ridiculous, mm. at that point you're like, okay, this is completely unattainable for most people. Yes, is the reason uh, is the only reason I'm doing this to flex. And like how much like, like you know, even if I can convince myself that the reason I'm sharing these numbers is because it helps people because it does. Mm -hmm. How much of like. How much of the actual reason behind why I'm doing this is to ultimately flex? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that, that's such a good point. So even me, I don't share all my numbers because I, I sometimes think that all my numbers could be quite scary mm. um, to people. So I think as a creator, our job is also about relatability as well. So I even did a challenge where I opened up a small online business and, um, and I didn't promote it and I didn't market it and I didn't tell people that it was my brand or anything. Yeah. And I did a video on how I made say eight thousand a month from this small business that I didn't market. So I was trying to just show people that 8,000 for an influencer business is very small in the scheme of things. But for an everyday person, yeah, that's like a lot of money. Yeah. So I actively did that in that way. So I could show people how it's possible to create something small yeah. without using brand or name or anything like that and build it from the ground up. And then I started getting stories from people who had done the same thing. So I feel like Bringing the numbers in a way that's understandable is important. The big numbers, let's not let's not stress people out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, how I made ten million this year. <laughs> that's your next video or something. It's like, mm, it's a lot. yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Um, this was so we were we, we were working with this YouTube growth coach guy, and um, his his insight was like really helpful. Like we, we we were sort of brainstorming title ideas for a video, um, and. You know, there was there was there was some like numbers we were playing around with. We were like, you know, sh should we make this how I make a hundred thousand dollars a month from off, off off the back of this business or, or something mm -hmm. like that? And he was like, no, 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 make it how you make a thousand dollars a month off the back of exactly. this business because that's like infinitely more relatable to people. If they see a hundred thousand a month, they're going to just assume it's not for them and this is completely impossible, which is kind of true. Yeah. Um, but a thousand dollars a month feels more manageable. Exactly. Or for example, a hundred dollars a week or even a hundred dollars a day, like the, those sorts of more manageable numbers, rather than getting into the tens of thousands or the hundreds of thousands exactly kind of thing um what was the like let's say someone is listening to this they're like you know mid uh, early to mid 20s they've got a job and they want to do a business on the side mm -hmm. to make that eight thousand dollars a month or whatever to supplement their income mm -hmm. what would how, how how would you approach that like do you have a, a method a system process like so i mean i would tell people to use the skills that they currently have, knowledge they currently have, tools that they currently have. So if you know something, so say someone I know who's really good at Excel, well, just either help people build Excel templates or sell Excel templates. Yeah. Like this is something you can already do. That's where I would start off and then looking at scaling that um, or pricing it higher. That's what I would tell most people to do. I wouldn't tell them to go and invest in a product um, and spend loads of on inventory without testing a model first, because I think that's really expensive and actually hard to like make happen. But I'd just say, use what you've got. Like if you've got a spare room, rent that out. Why you would have a spare room? I don't know, but yeah. something like that. Or if you like animals, why don't you start pet sitting or something or dog walking? So loads of dog walkers make like a ton of money because mm. they like dog walk 10, 10 dogs for like 50 pounds a day. They can make like 500 pounds a day. Is that, five, is that the right math? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Right, they <laughs> can do good. that, yeah. right? And even, for instance, I'm working with a cake decorator and uh, someone who does balloons and decor and like, you know, I'm paying her 500 pounds and it's it's something I can't do, but she's really good at it. She loves it. Um, so there's ways that people can make mm. money from things that they, they are good at doing already. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's like that Venn diagram of the, the things that you're good at, the things that you like, mm -hmm. and the things that there is a market for. Exactly. And I remember when, you know, my, uh, in, you know, I, I, I like to think of it as my origin story. When I was 18 years old, I got scammed out of my life savings when buying a MacBook off of Gumtree. Um, and I was like, right, I need to make this thousand pounds back because I'd saved up for like years and years to get to that oh. point. And I was like, all right, what's the list of things I'm good at and the things I like doing? And on that list was teaching. On that list, it was like making websites. And on that list was um, I did reasonably well in med school entrance exams to get in. Mm -hmm. I was like, cool, what if I combine teaching with the med school entrance exam? So I teach people how to get into med school and then I make a website for it that markets it nationally. And that was the thing that made my business successful. Uh, and, you know, I just think a lot, I think a lot of people are like, hey, I'm going to learn day trading completely from scratch. And, and then I'm going to make loads of money because I found some course that does it. It's like, it's really hard yeah. to compete in a market where you are not already good at the thing. Exactly. So step one is to get good at something. And if you're already good at something, then find a way to make money off the back of that if you can. Exactly. If not, it's you're fighting a losing battle or you recognize that it's not going to be far. So if you want to be a day trader, and you're going to spend three years or two years dedicated to learning it entirely fine, but you might be broke and lose loads of money in during that period of time. But you can get good in like three years, right? 10,000 hours and all that jazz. Yeah. So if you're willing to put the work in to get it good at something that's lucrative, fine, go ahead and do it. But I think most people have got abilities within themselves now to do something. Yeah. What about the whole um, people who, are, who decide they want to become a creator because it makes money? And they see people like you and me being um, open about some of some of our numbers. They're like, oh, I want a slice of that pie. It's not scalable or sustainable if you don't want to do it. So I when I started, there was no money in it. So when I there was I did it, these videos for three years without making a penny. I didn't know you could make any money in it. I was just doing it every single weekend after exams, after interning, like uh, every Saturday. I would just come and make videos because I loved doing it um, and it. I didn't see it as a business at all. I do think that if you wanted to come in strategically, I'm not mad at that. Like if you're strategic and you're like, I'm going to make money as a creator and this and this and this and this is what I'm going to do. Fine. Execute your plan and see what happens. Mm. Yeah. I think it's like, uh, it's the way we teach this in our, on our course is sort of this, there's kind of two approaches to being, to being like a YouTuber, for example, there's, uh, the archeologist and mm -hmm. there's the architect. So an archaeologist is like, cool, this looks good. I'm going to make a, videos, a few videos here. And then, okay, didn't really enjoy that. Let's find another one, make mm -hmm. a few videos there. And eventually they'll stumble on something that's like, oh, I enjoy this. People are getting, it's getting views and, mm -hmm. and life is good. And that seems to be how most YouTubers start off, just sort of making videos here and there until they stumble on their niche. Uh, and that's probably still what I'd recommend for complete beginners who mm -hmm. don't know how to make videos because it takes a while to get good at actually yeah. making videos. But if you are A, already good at making videos, mm -hmm. or B, you just want to treat it like a business from day one, then approaching it more like an architect is potentially a strategy where you analyze the market, you build out your plan. And then once you've got a clear idea of what your plan is, mm -hmm. then you execute on it. Right. Um, and so there's been, there've been quite a few channels that have decided to, for example, create content in the finance space mm -hmm. where the CPMs are ridiculous Yeah. Uh, because they're like, oh, there's a clear business here. Whereas mm -hmm. if you make content about books, you need about 50 times the amount of views to get the same amount of money. So like, <laughs> I why don't just make one finance video rather than a yeah. whole year worth of books videos yeah. to get the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. And it becomes like a business decision at that point. Yeah. But that's like, does that inspire you? Like that, so I did, I did I have a whole channel that grew to half a million yeah. in like a year finance on finance stuff. And I love it, but like, I'm bored of talking about finance now. Like I love it and there's other stuff I want to do around it. But the way in which I've, I did it, I feel like I've taught and shared everything that I have within myself right now about finance. I'm okay to like cool down on that. Although I have a new series coming um, that I wanted to talk about a few things that I thought would be super valuable for people. But again, my approach is different. Yeah. I'm, I'm a, not an architect, I'm a- Archaeologist. Archaeologist who wants to have architect yeah, it's, tendencies, it's, but it I don't. Like it sounds like from the, from the conversations we've been having, like you're more a creator first mm. and a sort of, a, you're more of a creative who's then building a business around that. Mm. Whereas I feel like I approach things as more of like an entrepreneur where then the creator element is just sort of a, a sprinkle into that. Um, I'm trying to get there, but again, I like the idea of like doing it from how I feel yeah. and what my heart says. Cause I think that's actually better in the long run. Or I feel more satisfaction personally. Yes. Yeah, definitely. That way. Yeah. Where someone else 
you know, may feel like the fact that I've executed my plan, they feel better from executing their plan, which might be more of you. Yeah, yeah, potentially. But I find for me as well, like when I go too much into the into businessman territory, it stops becoming fun. Okay. And then fine. it's like, okay, let's like, like claw it back a little bit and finding Spread some kind of to... middle way of like creator and entrepreneur and finding a way for the, the two to meet in the middle. So retaining like the artsy side of being a creator mm -hmm. with the data driven science-y plan, quarterly planning side of being an entrepreneur, mm. for example. I need probably more of that. Mm. I'm going to get there. Nice. What does your business look like at the moment? Like what are the, mm. what does the Patricia Bright portfolio look like? Portfolio look like. Okay. So maybe I break it down. So I, do you mean like as an individual or personally as well? Uh, both. Okay. So I have, I am an influencer yeah. in terms of, I talk about products and I work with brands a lot. Um, so most of my revenue comes from like brand partnerships, brand deals and working with them. Okay. And then I also have the break. The break is actually revenue, well revenue generating from the digital products. So we do sell digital products and guides and we have a career course coming out as well. And then um, I then have my investment um, business as well. So we've invested into a couple of companies. That's not revenue generating just yet that's like a long-term plan as well as then the properties that I've invested into. And then the next arm is really the kind of product arm that I'm going down, which is about bringing physical products to life with my partners. Mm. So the break is sort of YouTube channel website, generating content, mostly mm -hmm. through ads and uh, digital products. Digital. And we had a physical pro product. So we have a plan on our plan on, we've done it two years in a row has been really popular and, but I'm not doing planners again. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Mm. Labor intensive yeah. timelines, low margins. <laughs> China, lower yeah. <laughs> margins, Italy, shipping ports, weight, yeah. all these stuff that <laughs> you are, don't want to deal with. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. We don't want to deal with it. There's other ways that we can provide value that, doesn't give us that much aggro. And your and your brand deals is so. I, I noticed that you don't publish on YouTube that regularly anymore compared to what you used to. Mm -hmm. Is that mostly on Instagram these days, or like what does what does it look like? Exactly, it's mainly on um, Instagram now. In terms, of, and I, I still get YouTube deals. I think I, I think I only post when I have a YouTube deal, which is so bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I, I get deals on YouTube, and I still get deals on Instagram. But Instagram's probably bigger now. Okay. And what's the, how do you find, how do you strike this balance between uh, promoting a brand deal versus actually creating content that feels authentic to you that grows your audience? Um, or are they sort of tangled up together? They're kind of tangled up just together because I only work on brand deals with products and services that I love, that I know my audience will want to see and know and use anyway. Um, and that also includes like affiliate linking. So the good thing about m my job as an influencer is that our job was always to tell people about products and always to tell people about things we like and use. Mm. So I still get to do that. And then I get paid to do that. So it's not like I talk about other things and then I'm like, use this product. Yeah. Like was me working with say Estee Lauder or Lancome or um, L'Oreal, these are brands and products I use all the time. So if they launch something new, I'm like, oh my God, this is something new. I'm trying it out. I'm showing them how I try it out and I'll give my opinion. But sometimes it's not even about my opinion. It's just me showing how the product's used and I would have used it and bought it anyway. So nice. the balance is, there isn't really one. It's just, I keep creating what I was creating anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I guess, yeah, the way I think of brand deals, like, and, and I don't know if this is the right way to think of them. So I'd love to get your take on this. Mm -hmm. It's like kind of putting something out there that gives value to the audience for free is like add, almost like sort of adding money to the goodwill account. And anytime mm -hmm. I do a brand deal or try and sell something, it's withdrawing money from the goodwill account. And there needs to be this balance between depositing into the account and withdrawing from it. But I don't know if this is actually true. I'm just kind of bullshitting myself. Maybe that's the opposite way of you thinking about it. Mm. So when I tell my audience about a new product, I'm adding into the Goodwill account mm. because this is something they may want to try, use, or even know about. So like I'm giving them something that they weren't aware of. So I, I use a lot of affiliate links. I know that people want to buy the dress or they want to buy the makeup. They want to buy it. They're purchasing it. They wanted it. So imagine if I, so I recently worked with say Elizabeth Arden mm. and I gave, I gave them they, a free gift with it. Or so if, when they make a purchase, they get a, a free product. So many people bought it because they've been wanting to try it out. So I've just told them about something yeah. that they didn't know, but they want. 
So I don't see it like yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So it's like the mindset of like, in a way, promoting and selling is not an evil thing. It's actually doing the audience a service by telling them about a thing that they might want. Yeah. And nice. again, my industry has always been about showing product. So yeah. I'm just showing product that they want to know. Like there are people who watch QVC for fun. Oh, right. right. <laughs> so I would say that my audience are the kind of people who would love QVC. I always say I'm an infomercial queen. I love watching ads to decide what I might want to buy next. Like I'm that kind of person. Yeah. And I think the people who follow me like want to know stuff. Oh, okay. And then like, so with the, with the property portfolio, are you, are you open to talking about that? Like, yeah. yeah. How, how did that develop over time? When did you get started? Um, so, uh, so funny enough, my mum actually owned property. So she's an immigrant but she bought her like first council house. Um, and then she bought like five to six properties in total around the UK mm. herself. And so when I was like 18, I was helping her do that. Even when I was at uni, I helped her like with tenancy agreements and um, like cleaning and all that kind of jazz. So I've always been into property and I thought I hated, I thought I hated property management. But then when I started to get revenue and had some extra, and I was like, well, what should I do with this? The, the first thing I thought was, you know what, let me get into the property market. And so um, I bought, oh, the first place we actually bought was buying my own house from me. Um, we're using the company money to buy a house that we already owned. Mm. And so the company now owns my old house so that we could get the money to buy a new house. And then that was rented out and that was, that's been really yeah. cool and that's fun. And then um, the next property was because my sister was looking for her her house. And then the guy was like, well, there's a flat upstairs you might want to look at. It costs a bit more, but you might like it. And we we're like, oh, this is really cool. So we bought that flat. And then we like were looking at some auction properties and we bought one without seeing it. And then we bought it. It was like, oh, we love this. And then we bought that property and then a few others. And then oh, wow. it just kind of cascaded from there. Okay. So it's like you have a property investment company that buys the properties and then the rent goes into that. Yes. Yeah, so we have an investment company specifically for property. Nice. Yeah, that's really cool. I've started dabbling with that like in the last few months myself. Okay. Perfect. And it's quite fun. Yeah, uh, cool. I uh, don't yeah. do a lot of that. I'm not going to lie. My yeah. husband is the, yeah. he loves the property stuff because he goes to the houses. Oh, okay. And, like yeah. he fixes stuff and yeah. he like sees the electrician or he'll be like there with his like tool belt on. Yeah. Like, I've just got something to go sort out. So he <laughs> loves that kind of stuff. So he's living his dream. I'm like, yeah, yeah. you do it, whatever you like. And yeah, yeah. I think that's, uh, again, speaking of going back to that autonomy thing we were talking about, um, it seems like a lot of people who make money on the internet then are very keen to diversify away from internet-based revenue streams into something bricks and mortars -y like property. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you make money off of YouTube or whatever, and you know that you've got a few years in the limelight to really make hay while the sun shines. Mm -hmm. And you want to try to funnel that into more like long-term investments. Mm -hmm. I think it's a smart thing to do. I think it's what anybody with money does. So I have friends who are not in um, the world that we're in um they have property as well <laughs> like my friend my one of my friends has a coffee shop as well so he's invested into like hardcore brick and mortar businesses oh, wow. um so it's i think it's just smart money yeah. to do that kind of thing does your so you're fairly op open to talking about this does mm. your audience not like hate you for being a landlord or are they just fairly chill about my it? <laughs> audience do not hate me for being a landlord because yeah. I think people have seen my journey they know where I've come from they've no see me living in my mum's house in one room yeah. they know that I didn't have like I did not grow up with a silver spoon mm. or I've not had to do anything like crazy to make gen to generate revenue I've just continued to provide value yeah. and in entertainment and jo enjoyment and that's how I've generated revenue however I understand that some people are kind of against you know people who have resources but bearing in mind I, like I grew up in council property and I've had I lived in property with bad landlords and you know the government being my landlord so for me I was like if I have this opportunity I'm going to make sure I'm going to be a better version of a landlord so I don't increase rents so at least I know my tenants are happy this is my little way of like helping because the houses that we bought were in complete disrepair yeah. that nobody wanted like the government was selling off houses and like okay fine yeah. buy that one that no one no one wants it and I can afford it I'll buy it nice. and someone's in there um, I guess for a f final question I wanted to ask on the money front, and then I want to shift a gear to like identity. Mm -hmm. as like, just, just, to, just to sign first that. Um, do you feel like you have enough money 
or do you feel like you need to make more and then at, at some point you will have enough? Oh yeah, I don't feel like I have enough money. Yeah, that's a fact. Mm. So I, <laughs> I need more. Um, I'd like more for different things. So when okay. I think about how long life is, and then I think about like my revenue generating years, I recognize that there's probably more I need um, for the fact that I have children and I want them to go to school. And then there are other things I'm gonna do for other people. And like, I wanna be able to buy someone a house and be like, oh, that's fine. Hmm. Like, and then buy my mom's house and then do this for someone who needs it. So I know that I'm nowhere near that figure that I want to be at to do yeah. the things that I wanna do. Okay, have you got a number in mind? Or is it just sort of more than... Like a hundred million. Oh, okay. Yeah, fine. Is that, <laughs> yeah. It's a billion. Yeah, like, like... <laughs> is it ever increasing number, I bet? Um, no, I don't have a specific figure. Okay. Yeah, this is something that I think about a lot because, like, again, coming back to that stuff we were talking about around doing things for the passion versus doing things for the money. Mm -hmm. And something I often think about is like, uh, what, like if I, what, what's the difference between the way I'm spending my time right now versus the way I would spend my time if I had a hundred million in the bank. Okay. And like, so, and therefore that those two different scenarios illustrate what are the things I'm doing for money rather than for fun. And so I think even if I had a hundred million in the bank, I would still make YouTube videos and I would still do podcasts because it's cool talking to cool mm -hmm. people, but I probably wouldn't do courses because courses are specifically a revenue generating thing. And I just chuck them online for free. Got it. And so for me, it's like, the, well, then therefore the primary reason I'm doing courses is because it makes money, mm -hmm. which we then need to sustain the business. But either, either way, it's doing it for the money rather than for the joy. Yeah. And so I, I, I often feel like what's what's that balance between like, do I actually have enough? I mean, you know, with investments and stuff could probably comfortably get 40K a year. And if I need to, I can always just do freelance stuff. Yeah. So then why am I doing all this other thing? Like, how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, um, that's a really good point. I don't know if I do think about that. Um, I mean, I do feel like I could live comfortably mm -hmm. and I feel like I just know that there's other stuff I need to do. So until I'm there, I, I will continue to work towards it. But now I'm also in the position that I recognize creation is my main driver as I've discussed previously. And if the money comes, the money comes. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Like I'm I'm not gonna kill myself over that because again, I've recognized that money isn't a main motivator for me as yeah. well. So um, I think I'm satisfied, but I think I'd always want more. Yeah, fair. <laughs> it's, who doesn't want more? Who doesn't yeah. want a bit more money? Who doesn't want to yeah. look a bit better and be a bit younger and grow a bit more so yeah yeah so you talk in some of the finance education stuff around kind of living frugally um you know as you probably know there, there's this this concept in the personal finance world uh lifestyle inflation yes and how as you make more money you're you end up spending more money and mm -hmm. you know like you said a lot of your colleagues at the bank were make, having high salaries but were living beyond their means mm -hmm. do you try and combat lifestyle inflation or like how do you how do you feel about that side of things I think I'm actually really good like in terms of from my earnings and to how much I spend I am my percentage is really good I don't spend like to the max I save quite a lot and I think that is again because I've learned to be frugal again it's all relative because yeah. I still buy my Chanel bags yeah. <laughs> so, but you know I could buy more than that you know if I wanted to I don't want to but like I have friends who have like Aston Martins and like Bentleys and like this kind of stuff in my industry. And I'm like, oh, no way. I can never do that because mm. in my mind, it just feels excessive. Um, but for them, it might be the right thing to do. I just wouldn't do that. So I, I recognize lifestyle inflation and I've avoided it. Um, and I'm, I'm more about investing for the long run. Nice. Um, I want to change gears a bit to talking about identity. So you, um, I think a few a few minutes ago when we were talking, when I asked you about your portfolio, you said, well, I'm an influencer, therefore I work with brands, et cetera, et cetera. How do you think of your own identity? That's a good question. This is a really good question that I'm still trying to define and actually redefine. So for the last 10 years, I've been a, maybe I should say online content creator, because it's not just about influencing. I've been educating, I've been entertaining, I've been creating content and I also work with brands. So I've been an online content creator for the last 10 years, but, and that's been my identity, which is putting myself out there in a way that most people don't put themselves out there. I realize I'm a weirdo for what I put out there. It's crazy that I do this, but I do. Whereas I know that like for the next 10 years, 
I know that I want to, you know, also wear other hats. And I'm also a mum and I'm also a wife and I'm also an entrepreneur and I also run a brand and businesses. So I think I want to lean more into those as an identity um, moving forward. Hmm. So, yeah. The identity of personality as well. I'm a personality. Yeah. But I feel like everyone's a personality. So yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that means. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of find, my, find myself struggling with this when, like, it's it's very easy to have a very legible identity as being a doctor. Never, everyone knows what that involves. Oh, yeah, exactly. And then you yeah. leave that behind, you're like, oh, am I, you know, I guess I guess I'm an influencer now. What? what? <laughs> and then there's a prestige associated yeah. with it. Like, you know, I worked in banking. I was a banker, yeah. you know, or I'm a consultant. It's like, I'm an online content creator. Yeah, like, uh, <laughs> like I take photos of Instagram. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you know, I'm a doctor that I make videos yeah, I make, on make silly videos on the internet. Like yeah. that's it's a weird thing, like because it's still valuable. Like mm. there is this thing of people, even in the industry, they want to label you. Like even I work with certain management companies. Like, well, you're not a model. You're not an author. You're not a this. So they like to put people in specific boxes. I'm like definitely not a model. And I'm definitely not, well, I am an author because I've published a book, but I don't call myself an author, mm. but maybe I should. Mm. Don't know. <laughs> we could all wear different hats and have different titles. Yeah. Yeah. One, uh, one piece of advice I got from one of my author friends uh, was, uh, don't worry about the noun, think about the verb. So it's not, okay. I am a doctor, I am a YouTuber, I am a writer. It's like, I spend my time teaching medicine. I spend some of my time making videos. I spend some of my time right. doing writing. And thinking in those terms means that we're less, it's less like boxy. Because when it's boxy, in a way, there's something exclusive about that. Oh, I'm an author. That's my primary thing. Okay. Whereas we think like, what do you actually do? Oh, well, I look after the kids. I write books occasionally. I watch a bunch of TV and I record podcasts. Mm -hmm. There's something about that that feels to me more of like a, can I try and internally shift my identity into the the things that I do? Uh, Preferably not even that preferably actually my identity is who I am rather than what mm-hmm. I do but until until we get to that point of enlightenment yeah. my identity is you know the the verb that I'm doing rather than the noun yeah. that, that corresponds to I think that's great for us in, in, as an individual but I don't know if other people on the outside like accept that like, yeah. <laughs> it's that when you're talking to the companies and the yeah. marketeers they're like well you know we can't, can't put that in the strap line <laughs> yeah no, exactly so yeah yeah there's a, um, a friend of mine uh, Paul, Paul Miller who wrote this book oh the pathless path, which I always find myself plugging in these podcasts, because it's like um, basically how you find figure out what to what, what you want to do in life and mm. sort of reimagining our relationships, with careers and work and stuff. And so he used to be a high paying management consultant in like New York, and then he quit his job and became freelance. And then he kind of jokes that people would ask him, "Oh, so what do you do?" And he'd be like, "Oh, you know, I, you know, I go for walks in the park and I, I read some books and you know I listen to a podcast occasionally." And he would just people would just be like. Wait a minute, what? <laughs> like, right, exactly. that, that's not an acceptable answer to what do you do? It's mm-hmm. like they want a job title exactly. rather than what do you actually spend your time doing? But yeah. You seem to be very comfortable being authentic and being vulnerable and like sh- giving a lot of yourself to mm-hmm. the internet and have done for the last 12 years. How did you get comfortable doing that? Were you always that way? Like, yeah. So actually, I don't know if I am that comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. I think I'm a natural oversharer. Okay. I'm a natural like people pleaser. as well and when I put myself out there there was no one watching so I got so comfortable with putting myself out there in this way like when I first started creating YouTube wasn't the thing that it is today so it was so easy to naturally just be yourself and I just continue to do that because now that's what I've developed Um, but it is hard but I've recognized the power of me sharing my truth um, and just being authentically me and how much that impacts others. Um, and I like, and I've liked doing it, but there's a part of me that is ready now to like hold back a little bit more and share in a way that's a bit more channeled and productive. Productive as in like strategic for your wider business goals and exactly. stuff. Exactly, strategic. Like I don't need to share with you what I had for breakfast. Yeah. You know, my bowel movements, yep. like, I've done that, I've not done that, but like yeah, done everything, that yeah. like, you know, oh, it's a lot, like, there's there's no need for it like and also there's like this thing of like authenticity for the sake of like authenticity's Mm. sake it's like almost like pretend authenticity which you see a lot of people doing and it's not real it's very cringe to me like i'm so authentic no you're not it's an act you're just oversharing for the sake of it but um i'm trying to like just kind of hone back a bit oh interesting 
Yeah. So any, so um, I feel like a lot of people are in the other way around where they're like, oh, I, I feel really shy about putting myself out there online. I know it's probably better if I go a little bit more in terms of being comfortable with kind of being authentic on the mm -hmm. internet. Do you, do you have any advice for those people that are struggling with authenticity or displaying um, or being comfortable with putting themselves out there, for example? Well, I understand why someone would feel uncomfortable putting themselves out there. And I think you are in control of what you put out there, but you can't control how people are going to react to it. So there's an element of caution that you do have to exercise, but it's important for you to put your own boundaries like around that. Like, okay, I want to put myself out there, but I don't want to show my kids. I'm going to put myself out there, but I'm not going to share this side of things. Like you can determine the factors of how you want to do that. Yeah. And for me, my oversharing, I've, you know, for now, I'm just like, um, I'll share in a more structured manner. So it might be a sit down video where I explain something. And I've done that in the past. So like I shared my birth stories and that, that's been watched by more than 2 million people. Mm. And it was more, it was me definitely sharing quite a dramatic moment, yeah. but it was structured. Oh, it wasn't real time vlogging, live yeah. streaming. <laughs> I mean, there's some clips there. There was a bit like, oh. And there's, do you know, I've actually had real time clips of when I gave birth to my first daughter. And I said, you know what? We're not putting this out. Yeah. We just kept the sound effect. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's a lot. But I wouldn't do that now. That was too much. That was too much? Why? Do you know, it wasn't too much because people loved it. Yeah. Like, and people, and I loved it because I watched so many women give birth. That's how I knew how to, what was going to happen. Mm. So like, I felt like I had to give back. But now I'm like, I can't believe I put that out there. What, because it's cringe or like what? Just because it's a lot. I can't even watch the video. Oh, okay. Like, because I'm like, oh, it's emotional. It's cringy. It's like, oh, it's lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. How how did having kids change your online stuff, if, if at all? My ability to create as much as fast was reduced. Mm. Um, but I didn't change what I put out there because I'm, I'm not really the most like mummy. I'm not a mummy blogger. I don't make content about my children yeah. my my children are in my content but I don't make it about them at all um but before I could like film at three o'clock in the morning if I wanted to I could film any time of day yeah. but I can't do that now with kids like that they've got to be you know certain things have to be done in the morning they've got to be picked up after school I've got to be around as a parent and present mm. so I can't you know make as much on the fly content as I used to okay and did you I'm just... bound by time yeah I hate that <laughs> did you find that you, because uh, one thing one thing I've I've heard from a lot of like startup founders before and after kids is like before kids it's like the 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 main thing in my life is my work and therefore mm -hmm. I'm hustling at all hours of the day because it's really fun. Then after kids it's like I still enjoy the work and I still enjoy hustling, but actually there's I get a lot of joy out of spending time with the kids now. And so in a way the focus gets split. Did you find that happen for you or like how how do you? I, I guess what I'm asking is how do you balance? family life versus business stuff. There's definitely stuff. a split of focus. And I think I'm going to be completely transparent. I have the desire to spend way more time working. Like I have, I want to do more work, but I recognize that I can't. I love being with my children and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I have to sacrifice some of the work stuff that I love doing yeah. because I want to be a really present and valuable parent. So mm -hmm. sometimes it feels like a bit of a sacrifice, but in the same breath, like, I'm so joyful and happy when I'm with my children that it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like a bad thing. And also that when I then dedicate loads of time to work, I'm like, oh my God, I just want to be at home with my kids. So I want both basically. Yeah. And you just find a way to make it work. Exactly. Nice. And you have to give a little and take a little. And I know that my time is restrained and that's what it is. Do you worry about like the longevity of the career in an industry that's focused so much on looking young and looking young forever kind of stuff? Not for me, no. Because I, again, I I think it's very important to develop other skill sets. And I look up to um, women who have had long-term careers and it isn't just because they look good. Mm. Like there's, you have to have something else. So I pride myself in like, in my industry, I'm not the like the best looking girl in terms of like, I know the girls who are the, the hot girls, right? Who look amazing, but they've not got much to say about them. So I've seen hot girls come and go and new hot girls come in and replace them. But those who have personality and something about them are the ones who usually have like more, to say or 
they, they have more sticking power. Mm. So that's why I see myself. I want to be like 75 and witty with great hair and fake boobs. Nice. I feel like that's a great place to end the conversation. Thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, any Anything you'd like to plug? Any any ask for the audience? Anything like that? But nothing to plug right now. Oh, that no. Stuff's coming later on. Stuff's that coming, has okay. <laughs> Soon. Yeah, we'll put links to Just all of... Just follow me on Instagram. Yeah, links yeah. to all of the stuff down below and yeah. we'll we'll be the first to know when, when new stuff comes out. Perfect. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right, so that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.